Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. Okay, so we're getting back into Excalibur and we actually get to see the return of him. Okay, here's the thing. Technically, he's not one of the most powerful mutants Marvel has, but I think he could be. So like, <laughs> we get to see this guy make his return. Now, what this does is this initially picks up with Morgan Le Fay. For those of you guys who, who have read this comic, you guys understand I'm not covering the first three or four pages because I don't want to spoil who the person is. So... <laughs> Don't worry, we will. It'll all make sense. Now, remember, Morgan Le Fay has basically taken over Camelot. Now, that's really kind of what happened with her character. The big issue that we run into here, and the big thing that we're trying to struggle with here, is why she doesn't just leave Camelot, right? Because what's really been going on with her character is that you kind of have these these gates of Krakoa that are popping up all over the world. Not only that, they're actually popping up in other dimensions too, uh, where mutants who have resided there or currently do reside there in some form or fashion can access. Now, as far as we're aware, Camelot is the only place we've seen the only other dimension that exists out there that we've seen people basically access these gates and even then this gets kind of finicky right because technically camelot is inside other world and other world exists outside of the multiverse so the question becomes how is a krakow is able to reach beyond the multiverse and into this other realm and open gates right it's a, an almost insurmountable amount of power right because then the question becomes okay can krakow reach into like other universes like create gates in other universes that would seem to be the case the difference here and this is where things get a little interesting the difference here is that we would probably say no uh, because you can't just easily access another universe in the same way that you can when it comes to being able to access the other world, right? Being able to access the realm of Camelot and all that kind of stuff. But the idea here is that when it comes to like Mariana Stern, the agent of Morgan Le Fay in basically the main Marvel universe, that their goal, or at least the goal that Mariana has been tasked with is essentially taking out the mutant threat and like eliminating these gates, right? Because really Morgan Le Fay just kind of sees it as an encroachment on her power. Now, the reality in terms of why Morgan Le Fay hasn't left Camelot, entered into the main Marvel universe and solved this problem is because presumably like as far as we're aware, King Arthur Arthur's not there. We don't know where he is, but we simply know he's not there. And the indication seems to be that if she left, it would open the doors for somebody to conquer Camelot in her stead. And it's kind of a funny thing because when she's talking to Mariana, basically what Mariana Stern is saying is like, we know it has something to do with the guy Apocalypse, but we're not 100% sure. And it's kind of funny because the response of Morgan Le Fay is, well, if you think it's emanating from him, then why don't you defeat him, right? And that's something that's much, much easier said than done. <laughs> One does not simply walk up and defeat Apocalypse. It doesn't just work that way, right? The guy's just so OP. But again, picking up with Betsy Braddock and these guys, one of the funny things to come about this is that Jubilee's kid Shogo basically is able to tap into the power of fairies. Um, one of the things we also didn't really do though, people were asking about this, and we probably should have done it in the last video, was offer some measure of an explanation on Shogo. Shogo is not the biological child of Jubilee, right? It's not like she gave birth to Shogo or anything like that. In X-Men Volume 4, Issue Number 1, there was an attempt, there was really the creation of a character called Arcan, who was kind of like the sister of John Sublime, the bacterial entity Sublime, and it was really kind of building off what it was that, that Grant Morrison had done during his run on new X-Men, but essentially Arkea was making his return, you know, back to Earth, and there was like a meteor shower in this small village, and basically everybody in the area was killed, but Jubilee found this baby that was essentially, you know, its parents were gone, and she ultimately adopted it, and that's basically where Shogo comes from, right? Like, just a, a quick and dirty explanation, and it's basically been around ever since, right? Now, the reality is that it was one of the cool introductions for Jubilee, because it kept her character interesting, as opposed to her having been, like, this vampire at one point, but not really, kind of, something along those lines. It's a little strange, her character had actually kind of been free-floating in Marvel ever since Generation X came to an end. That was was really like where a character peaked in popularity, I think it was. But the overall gist of this is that when the baby passed through the dimensional barrier from the main Marvel universe into uh, Otherworld, somehow it was able to tap into the power of fairies. And we're not really given like a, a true explanation on how. It's one of these things where like they're kind of musing on it. And Betsy Braddock's just kind of like, well, I mean, it's a mortal baby in this realm, so it's exceedingly powerful. The indication seems to be that because it's a baby and because it has such such an imagination, uh, ultimately it can kind of tap into those magical abilities that are there. Whereas as adults, you know, as you become educated, your, your imagination becomes less less of a significant thing, you know, with regards to how your mind works, but we're not really given a hard and fast explanation. But the long and short is that ultimately Shogo just kind of takes on the form that it wants to. Now, the fact remains here that, of course, one of the big things you kind of get, and this is one of the cool things, this is why Gambit's cool, depending on how he's written, right? And in more, in recent years, he wasn't, wasn't nearly as interesting in you as he was, like, right after the events of X-Men the Animated Series, right? Like, in X-Men the Animated Series, I think is when he probably reached his highest level of popularity, but in the years it kind of came after, for about two years after the show went off the air, he was 
still pretty cool. And then he just kind of became a background character. But his love of, of Rogue is what makes him interesting, right? Because with his powers just being the ability to basically kinetically charge objects, it's okay. I mean, it's, it's like, okay, cool, you know, whatever. It's a fraction of what it used to be, right? You read the new Sun story, and it's just like, dude, this guy could have just like blown up planets. But focusing on the human side of him, that's what makes him interesting. And one of the things that he does is he basically lashes out at Jubilee and at, at, uh, at Betsy Braddock, right? Because he's like, none of you all here, you can pitch me whatever story you want to. But Rogue is literally sitting in a box on the other side of this dimension, you know, and she's just kind of there by herself. And we have no idea what's going on with her. Not only that, she's being watched over by Apocalypse, the last character in the world I would ever trust. And remember, Gambit's not just saying this to say it, he's saying it because he was a horseman of Apocalypse once. He has an intimate understanding both through that experience as well as having fought Apocalypse multiple times over the years, that Apocalypse is not necessarily the most trustworthy character out there. And so putting the life of Rogue in the hands of a character who's dubious at best, you know, and who is incredibly overpowered and could potentially even take Rogue and turn her into a horseman because it suits what it is that he wants to do, is the last thing Gambit wants to do. And, and his, his stance here is like, you guys never would have left somebody over there like that, right? Like you, Jubilee, actually went to the other dimension and got your child and brought him back because you didn't want him to be there with Apocalypse. You, Betsy Braddock, never would have left somebody that you cared about in the hands of Apocalypse. But you're telling me with a straight face that I need to do it because it's the right thing to do? Get out of here. And it's it's so cool because it's like, you guys are so full of crap. You guys are pitching me this because you want to complete a mission. You don't care about Rogue. You care about your mission. Like what you care about is getting Brian Braddock back. And you'll say whatever you need to in order to make it happen. It's amazing. Like it's this amazing back and forth because what it does is it shows how much Gambit cares about Rogue. In his mind, there's Rogue and then everything else. And that's true. Based on the, the interactions the two have had over the years and even the, the story that we got when they were married for a short amount of time, like Gambit, you know, like any man who's in love with the woman that he's with would let the world burn before he let anything happen to her. And, and it's, a, it's a cool thing to see that in the character of, of Gambit because it makes him more tangible and more relatable. And I think it's probably some of the best handling of his character in quite some time, actually. So I love seeing his character depicted in this faction. The issue with this is, of course, once they basically end up traveling to the castle of Morgan Le Fay in an effort to basically try to break in and get Brian Braddock when they get there, then like they're met by all these magically enhanced knights. And the result of this is that what you also end up getting is the inability for Betsy Braddock to dominate their minds. All she can do is read, her, read their surface thoughts. Now, this is a byproduct of, of Morgan Le Fay basically using her magics to kind of protect her various knights that are there. And that's one of the important things to understand is that while Morgan Le Fay doesn't really play a hand in dealing with like the X-Men, right? You don't really see her fight the X-Men. She's not oblivious to them, right? It's not like she's unaware of what the X-Men can do or what they're capable of. And even people with just telepathy, right? Because the X-Men aren't the only ones who have it. Being able to understand that power and understand what someone like Betsy Braddock can do and then fortify her forces against that really show just how capable Morgan Le Fay is. And so what you end up getting here is Brian Braddock, who again was previously transformed into the Black Knight who arrives on the scene. Now remember, the longer he stays under the spell of Morgan Le Fay, the longer he stays under her control, the further and further he gets away from himself. And so what you get are these small little moments here and there, right? Like he basically goes to attack Betsy Braddock, the two of them fight, and you get these small little moments, right? Where she's mentioning names like Megan, the wife of Brian Braddock, where she's saying things like your brother Jamie has come back and so on and so forth. And some of these things kind of resonate with him to a degree, but before anything can happen, suddenly of course you basically have Shogo who shows up, uses Dragon Flame to kind of spray everything down. And Brian seems to kind of have this recollection of who he is, but then he's whisked away by Morgan Le Fay. And so what it does is it kind of gives us this little bit of a glimpse, you know, with the possibility that Brian can make his return. Maybe he'll go back to being Captain Britain. Maybe it'll be Betsy Braddock, right? I mean, you know, Brian has been Captain Britain for decades, so maybe it's time for somebody else to take over the mantle. But he is also a mainstay in, in like the British side of Marvel Comics, right? I mean, it's like it's like if Steve Rogers was no longer Captain America anymore, right? I mean, you could lose the mantle, but then ultimately, if you've been reading Marvel Comics long enough, you know that he would come back, right? So that's exactly how it is with Brian Braddock. And so that's why it's kind of cool to see this, because for me, it's not, a, it's not really an issue of, oh my God, Brian Braddock's never going to be Captain Britain again, right? Be foolish of me to believe that. But what, what is interesting to me is how is he going to come back and go back to being Captain Britain again? That's what I want to see. <laughs> That's what intrigues me. And so as a result of this, what you end up having is really Apocalypse kind of getting frustrated with his ability to understand how these magics work with regards to like Otherworld and the Druid magics and the magics of Clan Akaba, uh, those individuals who were once, you know, led by Apocalypse, who he ultimately abandoned, his inability to really tap into magic. Now, this is important because what this shows is it's really kind of an unofficial weakness of Apocalypse, not a physical weakness, not in so far as like if faced by somebody who can use magic, he will ultimately be defeated. Uh, what it means is that like there are elements and things out there that Apocalypse still doesn't really understand. And that's kind of important because of course he's been around for 5,000 years, but it's one of these things where Marvel's basically saying, yes, he's old, but he has not seen and done it all. He's seen and done a lot. And so it's, it's kind of a cool little thing because what he says is like, okay, I can't really tap into these things. I can't really like control these, these stones the way that I need to. I need to find someone who can. And so what he ends up doing here is 
actually leaving Cornwall and then traveling to like Central Park, it looks like. And people are just kind of like, dude, is that such and such? And it's just kind of like, dude, don't stare, man. Like, don't stare. And it's kind of crazy. He just like boldly walks through the park. <laughs> <laughs> and makes his way finally to like this apartment complex. And when he walks in there, he rips the door off this apartment. You know, this kid is like, what the heck is going on? And Apocalypse is just like, be quiet, kid. Like, you need to come with me. Now, the question is, who is this kid? This kid is Julio Richter, also known as simply just Richter. And he is one of the most powerful mutants in Marvel Comics, I think. Now he's not powerful insofar as he has like extreme reality manipulation powers or anything like that. He does have clairvoyance. Uh, that is to say the ability to like see into the future, understand people's emotions, different things like that. But I think probably the, the, the really the main focal point of his power is the ability to control the earth. He was one of those characters that originally lost his powers during the events of House of M and then during Children's Crusade got his powers back. But like, that's the thing, like sometimes Time really recently, like, you know, during the events of House and Powers of X, he seemed to have lost control of them. And so he was always kind of afraid of going to Krakoa because he was afraid he would shake the island apart. The reality, and this is one of the important things, Apocalypse is just like, one, you can't be afraid. You have to learn to harness your power, right? Your power is part of you. You have to learn to harness and control it. But two, Apocalypse makes a very important thing. He's like, you can basically alter and, and, and like change the world miles below the surface right now. What this does, and this is one of the funny things about it, by my definition of Omega level, it makes him an Omega level threat, or at least an Omega level mutant. And the reason why is because his power is literally like earth based, meaning he's a danger to the earth itself. Now, technically speaking, Omega level is like, there's no definitive upper limit to that power. Uh, and because of the fact that he manipulates planets, I would say that like, if given enough time, if he's able to like control it enough, he can move like other planets and things like that, which would be absolutely beast to be able to see. But Richter's like one of these unsung heroes of Marvel, like one of these unsung heroes of the X-Men. But that's the thing, like, like literally this guy could just like crack the earth in two if he wanted to. And that's what he's afraid of, right? Like being unable to control his powers that like they would eventually go awry and he would basically crack the earth in half he would destroy the entire world is what he's afraid of and he actually could like he legitimately could if he lost control over his powers or pushed to the extreme all you would need is the same kind of scenario to unfold uh, after emma frost woke up from her coma when she was attacked or at least when all the hellions died and then she took over the body of iceman and then realized that like bobby drake is an omega level mutant if his powers are pushed high enough that's the exact same thing you need with richter but that's why he's basically been brought in by apocalypse is like i need you to be able to one like use your clairvoyance powers and then two, to also use your powers to control the earth, to help me basically understand everything going on with these stones and, and so on and so forth. But what we also end up finding out here is that MI-13 is on the hunt for the new captain or for, for Captain Britain, because it's a necessary character for England itself. And the person who shows up here is none other than Pete Wisdom. Now, Pete Wisdom is cool. He's not, he's not really cool in terms of powers. He's got these like, you know, solar knives, basically like these, these flaming knives. He absorbs like ambient solar energy and then creates like knives out of him and stuff like that. But what it basically means is like Marvel's pulling out all the stops for like a lot of the British characters. Things are about to pop off is basically what this means. <laughs> The Excalibur stories are gearing up for some pretty big things. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you guys are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like, and I will catch you all later. Peace. We've got some new patrons in our top tiers over on patreon.com slash comics explain. I want to give a shout out to Jason C, Austin S, Austin H, Philip, and Austin B, as well as Steven Z, Eagle F, Joey M, and Jeff R, as well as Genosis916. As always, we just usually keep the last name to an initial. It helps you guys to maintain your anonymity. Some of you guys have expressed concern about having like your first and last name thrown out there for the world to see. I do not blame you. For you guys who have joined up as part of our Patreon tiers that are eligible, for Rob Corps Honor Guard rings. Those whose rings have been sent out, you should already have them. If you're a new person who just joined up and you've been part of this tier for a month, your ring will be mailed out to you. So I want to say thank you guys for being patrons.